Hello, I'm Marvin Kalb, and in just a moment, an hour of live, unedited, unrehearsed conversation with Senator Paul Simon of Illinois, a Democratic candidate for President of the United States. Stay with us for Candidates 88, coming right up. This series is made possible by a grant from the New York Stock Exchange Foundation as a public educational service. From the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Candidate 88 with Marvin Cowell. This week, a conversation with Paul Simon. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. I'm Marvin Kalb, director of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. Our presidential selection process is such that the pollsters and the press generally end up telling us what we're supposed to think about a particular candidate and what they are telling us to think about Paul Simon of Illinois, in the words of one uh, editorial writer, is that he is a rocket ship, at least at this point in the campaign. Well, it seems as if that rocket ship has leveled off just a bit, but there is still the question. Can a man who wears a bow tie, horn-rimmed glasses, two hearing aids, who didn't finish college, and who was once a journalist ever be elected president of the United States? Well, in time we'll find out, but we do know a little bit about the candidate now. Paul Martin Simon is 59 years of age, occupation, senator, and presidential candidate, hometown, Lacanda, Illinois, family, married, two children. Education, attended the University of Oregon and Dana College, but left after his third year. Military service, Corporal, Army, Counterintelligence Corps, 1951 to 1953. Career, first-term senator, five-term congressman, lieutenant governor of Illinois, member of the Illinois State Senate and House of Representatives, and for 18 years, editor and publisher of the Troy Tribune and owner of a weekly newspaper chain. Let us now welcome Senator Paul Simon. <laughs> Senator, Senator let's, start. Okay. let's start on your economic plans. Get right down to business. Uh, one of your colleagues, Nick Gephardt, said recently that uh, your plans add up to Reaganomics with a bow tie. And even a number of your aides, with whom I've talked in the last couple of days, say that it's about time for you to begin to spell out some of the, spell out some of the specifics. What we have so far is a long list of very good things, but do you feel that you can actually implement that kind of program and within three years get this gigantic budget deficit down to zero? And tell us how. We can. And, and first, if I may just talk in general about the, kind of the, the premise of your question, because one of the ways that Ronald Reagan has affected this country is not only in what has happened to the budget and in our priorities, but also in our thinking. We now have a mindset out there that says we can't do all kinds of things. And uh, I don't accept that mindset. Uh, some of my opponents are so frightened that they may be labeled a big spender that they're unwilling to make the investments that this nation ought to make. We're not going to do what we need to do as a nation just drifting into the future. We, we have to, to seize and create our own future, our own destiny. Now, if I may get to the specifics, if I can break it into two categories. Mm -hmm. One, how do you move on a balanced budget? I've said at the end of my third year, barring a recession, we're going to get it down to zero. At the present, the projection is between 50 and 100 billion dollar deficit for that third fiscal year. 
you can, without impairing the defense of this country, reduce outlays by the end of the third year in the area of defense by $20 billion. Secretary of Defense Carlucci, uh, just this la these last few days, has been talking about a $30 billion, that's over a period of years, uh, cut. Uh, second, you can move in very specific ways to encourage employment in this country. Moving on the trade deficit. I think you could get the trade deficit down by one-third. That alone would add about a million and a half jobs. And you don't do that just by uh, wishing it happens. You do it by, number one, putting one person in charge of, uh, of trade. We now have 18 different agencies that handle trade. It is no wonder that Japan uh, or any other country isn't listening to us because we don't have anybody in charge of the shop. And, and if I may digress just to give you a good illustration from Illinois, Caterpillar signed a contract for almost a billion dollars, as I recall, for the Soviet Union to, for earth-moving equipment for the Trans-Siberian Pipeline. One of the 18 agencies involved is the Defense Department. They vetoed the contract. The Soviets then went to France and Japan to buy the earth-moving equipment. Who lost out? Wasn't the Soviet Union, wasn't France, wasn't Japan, was the United States of America, needlessly, and the pipeline was built ahead of time. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing, but I think a series of very concrete steps can reduce that trade deficit. You can also do further employment, to further employment, do some things to see that the capital of this country is used not for corporations to gobble each other up, but for research, to increase productivity, to create jobs. I think you can create an additional million and a half jobs. That reduces unemployment a million and a half, uh, one and a half percent. Each one percent you reduce unemployment, you save 30 billion on the deficit. That one and a half percent would be 45 billion. That's 20 plus 45 is 65. I think if you make clear you're getting a hold of things so that you don't have monetary and fiscal policy in conflict, you will see at the end of a two-year period a drop in interest rates at least of 2%. Prime rate in the United States is 8 and 3 quarters percent. Prime rate in Japan is 2.5%. That, that should bring at the end of the, of the third year, since each 1% you reduce interest, you save $24 billion a year ultimately. That at the end of the third year ought to conservatively save $30 billion. That should provide the money for balancing the budget. And if it does not, as a last resort, I'm willing to increase taxes to see that it's done. But I am committed to that we're going to stop borrowing from our children and our grandchildren and future generations. Senator? Yes. One of you have been describing ways in which you might be able to try to get the budget deficit down, but a lot of your domestic programs are obviously going to cost a lot of money. I would like, uh, with your assistance, to just tick off a number of these programs and ask you, on the basis of your current estimates, how much is each one of those programs going to cost so that we have some feel for the specific, the detail, as well as, well as the generality. For example, your job training program. You yourself have estimated that in the first year, that's going to cost between 3 and $5 billion. In the second year, as much possibly as $8 billion. Tell us about the third, fourth, and fifth years. How much is this program going to cost? Okay. First, let me say there are three priorities in spending, and priorities that have to fit within the one trillion dollars that is now part of the federal budget, thousand billion dollars. The uh, first year, uh, as I, as you indicated, the jobs program would cost uh, three to, to three billion. I think at the most is five billion in gross. You save some on welfare and, and the other things. Then in the out years, how much we spend will depend on our revenue. We're not going to, uh, I'm not going to have just endless uh, programs. But I think we have to reverse that. Again, this is part of the mindset. We have to also ask ourselves, what does it cost this nation not to have a jobs program that deals with this whole problem of the underclass in our society? We never ask those kind of problems. What does it cost in teenage pregnancies? What does it cost in our failure to invest in people and teach them how to read and write and lift them as my jobs program does? Uh, that's part of it. But the, the jobs program, education, and long-term care for, for seniors, those are the three priorities. And the last one has to have a self-financing mechanism. 
Uh, I want to I do it specifically, though, okay. step by step. The expanded college student loan program I that you talked about. Yes. How much money is that going to cost? I, I have not talked about an expanded student loan program, but rather a shift from, from loans to grants. And that's going to have to be gradual. And I can't assign a specific dollar term to it, but the interesting thing is the present program, the loan program, we have shifted from 46% of college assistance being loans uh, eight years ago now to 80%. And that is very, very costly. How much is the child care program going to cost that you'd like to I, institute? I, I can't tell you, but that's part, that will be part of uh, a jobs program. It is, again, uh, there are going to have to be priorities. The child care thing can be tied in with the education programs also. Okay. You've talked about an all-out attack on adult illiteracy, also related. But how much will that cost? That is, right now we're spending, uh, well, I got $5 million in the library program. I got $2 million in the VISTA program, uh, lower college work study. If we were to expand that to, let's just use a, a figure, $500 million, that would be a huge amount for that kind of a thing, and it would pay off so quickly. 23 million functionally illiterate adult Americans. What does it cost not to do it? All right. You, uh, you have also said that you want a assignment administration to move quickly on water protection, acid rain, the ozone layer. Those are big-ticket items that will cost a lot of money. How much money can you tell the American people that those are going to cost? They, they, they are not big-ticket items in big. terms of, uh, of cost in the, in the federal treasury. It, it's like Superfund is not a treasury cost. It's a, it's a very fine program. I'm one of the co-sponsors of it. But it does not add to the treasury cost. Uh, acid rain, for example, uh, the program will be worked out so that it, uh, whatever the, the end result, it, it will be a small fee attached in some way to the utility industry to pay for acid rain. But we have to move on. Again, what does it cost not to move on acid rain? Well, that, that's a fair enough question, but you'll admit it's, it's rhetorical. But for the purposes of, of our interview, I'd like us to try to be, if it is at all possible, specific on the costs of these programs. In a gathering age of austerity, which certainly faces us, this country, how are you going to pay for all of those additional government-funded programs at the same time as you say you're going to knock down the budget deficit to zero in three years, and only then are you going to consider, as you said a moment ago, raising taxes? How would you do that? Well, let me first talk about where we're wasting money right now. One of the, the massive drains in our economy that I want to get a hold of. Fiscal year 1980. We spent, the, I'm talking about the federal government, spent $83 billion for interest on the federal debt. This fiscal year, we will spend $203 billion for interest, an increase of $120 billion for interest. What do we get for it? Nothing. And all of a sudden, I come along and I say, let's spend 3 or $5 billion on a jobs program. Let's spend a few billion more for education and I'm labeled a big spender. The reality is we can do these things, and but many of these things are going to have to have a self-financing mechanism with them. What do you mean and of that financing, that, that there has to. Let, let's just take long-term care. We cannot take long-term care out of the budget. We have to face the problem. This, the long-term care thing is going to explode on us very, very shortly. By the end of the century, one out of six Americans will be over the age of 65. Uh, we will have almost six and a half million Americans over the age of 85. We have to work out a system to pay for that. And that may, may mean an additional 1% of Social Security. There are other proposals. Uh, I have said immediately after it is clear I'm the nominee, I'm going to appoint a committee to look at this. I hope that committee will report back before the election, in any event by January 1st. But I'm not going to approve any long-term care program unless there is a mechanism for financing with it. But what you mean a moment ago when you said 1% of Social Security? You mean that there would be a 1% cut on the amount of money going out to the people getting Social Security? That, that is correct. It would be 1% on employer, 1% on employee. 
That, that what would that one, add up that, in a year? That is one possibility. No, but what would that add up to? I, How much I money would that I can't give you the figure just offhand. Okay, Senator, let, it's enough about economics for a sec. Let's move on to politics. Um, some recent polls have suggested that your rocket ship perhaps has begun to level off just a bit. And in those polls, the candidate, interestingly, who comes in in first place is none of the above. Now, why is it that from this group of six Democrats, not one has yet emerged to capture the popular imagination? I think largely because we're unknown. Uh, we still are, despite even after being on this program, Marvin, I'll still be relatively <laughs> unknown. Uh, you had a comparable situation in 1976 where uh, um, there was virtually no one who was known. And then after the Iowa caucuses, Jimmy Carter emerged. But it is interesting that in the state of Iowa, none of the above no longer leads the pack. That's quite be right. Because I think the people in Iowa have seen enough of us that they're, they're making choices. It is still nevertheless, Senator, would you agree, a serious problem because some of the Democrats whom you know, uh, Bob Strauss, Chuck Robb, uh, Bob Graham of Florida, are now talking among themselves and other Democrats as well, looking beyond the six who are now running and trying to get a seventh and eighth and ninth who might come in who will be, in their view, electable. One, do you think that is a fair thing for these other Democrats to do to those, to those candidates who are now running? Oh, it doesn't bother me. But, no. but frankly... 1976, exactly the same thing was happening. People were gathering and said, we, we have to get a different candidate other than those, these candidates who are out here. And uh, Do you yourself at this point see a Cuomo or a Nunn or a Bradley emerging at the very last minute and say, hey, friends, I'm available, take me? I, I can't discount it totally, but I would be very surprised. Do you think that you are going to get Governor Cuomo's support? I can't answer that. He said some generous things about me. He was even been kind enough to say it looks like Paul Simon is going to be very strong in New York. And, of course, I concur in his judgment in that. <laughs> <laughs> you have also said some very kind things about him. You've said that he is uh, superbly qualified for any government position. Quote, we need your leadership. Leadership for what? For the presidency? Leadership to move around the country. There have been people, not you, but others, Journalists who say if he's really not interested in the presidency, he shouldn't be speaking out on the issues. Right. He shouldn't be running around the country. And you, I say we need that. We need that voice. There's no question he's one of the most articulate spokespersons in this nation. And for the people who really understand the issues and who have one other quality that I think is important, Mario Cuomo cares. I want a government that cares. I want a government that's willing to fight for people and not a government that, that uh, is responsive only to the whims and the wishes of the rich and the powerful. We've heard a great deal in this campaign, Senator, you know, about the word and the issue of character. Why do you think it is such an important issue in this campaign? I think it's an important issue in, in every campaign. I think for a variety of reasons. Uh, we've had headlines about various candidates in both the Democratic and Republican Party is probably more of an issue. I think what has happened with the Iran-Contra thing also makes it more uh, of an issue. But I would add, as a former journalist who still writes occasionally, uh, that um, I am concerned that we don't go too far off on that. Uh, Meaning what? Too far off? Too, too far in the, in the direction of, of probing to the point where we're not examining the issues as you and I are today. But we're, let me give you a very practical example. The, uh, when the birth date of the first child of one of the Republican candidates makes the front pages of every newspaper in the nation, I'm not sure that's the real kind of issue that we ought to be looking at. I think the important issue is what are the candidates saying about the future of a child born today? That's what we really ought to be looking at. It's interesting, Senator, because a couple of uh, evenings ago, Senator Kennedy, your colleague, was in this forum and launched a rather polite but nevertheless clear-cut criticism of the press in the way in which it is covering this campaign, uh, implying very strongly that there is in the press coverage a kind of trivialization of serious political issues in this country. 
Do you agree with the senator from Massachusetts? There is some truth to that. And if I may take two minutes to tell you a story about when I was Do it in, in a the, little less. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was in the state legislature in Illinois, and Senator Douglas called me one day said, will you introduce a resolution calling on me to make the corn tassel the national flower? And I, I, since I had great respect for Paul Douglas, I agreed to do it, and I got thinking about it all day. That night I called him, and I said, Paul, are you sure you want me to introduce a resolution calling on you to make the corn tassel the national flower? And he laughed. And he said, just remember this, Paul, the substantial things you do in politics don't get very much coverage. You have to do the trivial things to get coverage. He says, you introduce it, I'll introduce it at the national level. It'll be in every newspaper in Illinois. It'll be defeated, but no one will be angry with any of us. And he said, you will have done something to stay alive politically. It was a very interesting insight both in the politics and in the journalism. Yeah, but that seems to be the lesson only of survival, not necessarily of leadership. I mean, for example, you were participating along with 11 other candidates the other night in Washington in a debate. And in two hours on NBC, you and the other 11 were supposed to have set forth your views. The American people were supposed to have learned from that process. Did you get a chance in your own view to set forth your views, and do you think the American people learned from that process? I think the American people learned from the process, but let me give you a good example. This whole question of the economic package, how do you move to a balanced budget and also invest in the future as we have to. I had to answer that in one question. I met with my staff, and we finally decided it is just impossible to answer in one question in one minute. So. Let's just say we're, we're going to provide the evidence and say what we want to do, but, but really duck the question. I think it was probably a mistake, but it is very... A mistake to duck the question? To, to mistake to have ducked the question. I should have... But how would you do it if you don't have the time? Well, that is the very... It, I could have started answering it, and then Tom Brokaw could have cut me off. <laughs> do you feel that these debates, which you run from one to another to do all across the country, are good things or things that you simply feel you must do? They are good if they're limited in number. We have too many of them. What can you we, do about it? I suppose I could decline, but when the other candidates accept, it makes it very, very difficult. So that you're locked into one of these cycles that even you as a candidate can't quite break out of. It, it is very difficult. Now, I, I, I have uh, not attended a few because of other commitments. I much prefer this kind of a format where you really can probe in, a, in a, at least a little more depth what a candidate believes. Well, so do I. But um, <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that the whole process is front-loaded too much on Iowa and New Hampshire? I do not. I think there is something very good about two states where you have to go into someone's living room, where you really, you can't just use the glitzy television, uh, multi-million dollar approach and move in. Uh, it's where, uh, so the candidate like Paul Simon, who's not nearly as well financed as at least one other candidate, a couple of others, uh, that uh, I really have a chance. My, frankly, my voting record is such that as you tick off the major contributing financial interests, uh, my voting record is not a good one for getting political campaign financing. It's great for the people of this country. But uh, in Iowa and New Hampshire, I have a chance. Okay. Now, you said just about, if I quote, if I can win both those states, that would just about do it. Now, that quote really fascinated me. These two states represent a very small fraction of the percentage of Americans who will vote, even in the primary process. And yet, by your own yardstick and your own calculation, if you can win those two states, that would just about do it. What is so fair about that kind of system if that were just about due in only two states? I've, I think that, and I'm not absolutely sure on this, but I think if you will check with the reporter who wrote that, he said, if you win those two states, would that yeah. just about do it? And I said, it might. And, uh, uh, and that's how, uh, how the quotation came out. But it if could. I'm taking it out of context, I apologize. Yeah, no, no, is the no. point still valid? But the point still has some validity. I don't think it would just about do it, but it would give you a huge leg up on the ladder. There's no question about it. Now, 
there are things about Iowa and New Hampshire that are not typical of the nation in terms of percentage of blacks and Hispanics and in a variety of other ways. But uh, you are tested in small states where people really have a chance to, to get to know you. And that, I think, is a very healthy thing. Now, the test goes beyond that. And you can still stumble well beyond New Hampshire. You are, uh, Senator, in addition to being a politician, a writer. You have written 11 books, and one very cynical reporter I talked to the other day said that you have written more books than most of your candidates on the other side have read. But, and that's a terrible thing to say. But if there is a 12th book in the works, would it be about this campaign? The 12th book in the works will be my eight years in the White House. <laughs> Okay, let me, what is the best book? I ask you this because your wife says that you don't read fiction. What is the best book that you've read? Best. That I have written or read? Read. <laughs> I know you think all 11 are the best. Yeah. Books. In terms of the best book I have read, um, I guess the, the book that really moved me, I was about 11 or 12 years old, and I read... Black Boy by Richard Wright, uh, not as famous as his book Native Son, but uh, while my father had been active in civil rights and everything, it just stirred me as nothing has ever stirred me that I've read before or since. Because? I, I, for some reason, it, it just hit me at the right age at the right time. And one other interesting little sidebar on that, Richard Wright, I learned years later, became a writer through a WPA uh, writer's project. Mm -hmm. The Federal Jobs Project brought him out and enriched the nation and enriched me. Senator, one of the, uh, none of your books is about foreign affairs, so that in the time that I have left, let's, let's talk about that. Would your, in your view, would a Simon administration devote itself primarily to the achievement of arms control agreements with the Soviet Union? Well, I think that has to be a major item on the agenda. But I think we have to also recognize that if there is an unthinkable World War III, it is unlikely to happen as World War II started with one superpower attacking another. It is much more likely to happen as World War I did with some incident somewhere. And so you have to use the tools of diplomacy in Central America, in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf, wherever, to prevent in the eruption. Uh, I think that it also has to be very much on the foreign policy agenda. Now, Robert McNamara, former Secretary of Defense for Presidents uh, Kennedy and Johnson, said here at Harvard a couple of weeks ago that in his view, nuclear weapons simply cannot be used as a first strike weapon. In his view, it just can't be used. No matter what the circumstance would be, you can't use it. You share that? I don't think anyone can go quite that far. I think you can go almost that far. But the reality is if there would be, say, a conventional strike on, by the part of the, on the part of the Soviets in the Central Europe, uh, nuclear war, nuclear weapons would be used. If the United States or Western, West Germany or somebody invaded the Soviet Union, nuclear weapons would be used. But I would add, I think we have matured to the point where that kind of a frontal assault is very, very unlikely. But just to be clear, in the event that the Soviet Union, because of its superior conventional strength in Europe, were to break through and move into West Berlin, move toward Paris, a Simon administration, you as president, would be prepared to use nuclear weapons to stop I don't, I don't think any president can exclude that possibility. But I think what you have to do is to prevent even that uh, possibility from occurring through uh, greater understanding and through, um, on our side, a buildup of the conventional forces moving away from excessive reliance on nuclear weapons. On that issue of conventional forces, we know that uh, the President and General Secretary Gorbachev have already agreed on a treaty to ban medium and short-range missiles. Um, Senator Byrd has just said that he thinks the next step should not be an effort on the part of the two superpowers to try to get a treaty on long-term, long-range offensive and strategic defense, 
but instead to go for a treaty on conventional weapons. Do you agree with that? I would like to see whether it's a formal treaty or not. I'm not sure a formal treaty is necessary. Uh, I would like to see some withdrawal of the conventional forces on both sides. I think that would be a healthy and a stabilizing uh, thing. But you have talked about a withdrawal uh, under a Simon administration, a withdrawal of American forces from Western Europe, and I want to be clear whether you had in mind a unilateral withdrawal or a withdrawal that would be pegged to an agreement with the Soviet Union. I, I would like to work, I think you have to negotiate this kind of thing with our allies in Western Europe and with the Soviets. I do think that we, we now spend 6.7% of our GNP on defense, our friends in Western Europe spend 3.3 percent. At one point, that kind of an imbalance made sense. About 40 to 45 percent of our expenditure on defense is for the defense of Western Europe. I think it is only reasonable that our friends in Western Europe pick up more of the tab. And uh, I think in some way, between the Soviets and our NATO allies and the United States, we are going to have to move toward some lesser U.S. role in Western Europe. I, I want to ask you a question about that. Do you mean that you foresee the possibility that in five years, ten years down the road, the United States could begin to pull away from its total defense through the NATO alliance of Western Europe? I think our commitment to defend Western Europe has to remain, and that has to be strong, and no one should question that. Within NATO? But, but, within NATO. That is correct. But I think we also have to say, we have to ask very serious questions, whether in view of our economy, whether it is, and in view of the, the substantially improved economies in Western Europe, whether the present imbalance in investment really makes sense. And then I think we should do, we can take some steps, such as Henry Kissinger has suggested, of having uh, the military commander in Western Europe be a Western European. I don't think it has to be an American. I think we can take some steps not to totally disengage. I think that would send the wrong signal. But to say to our friends, you have to assume more of the burden. One final question for me, and that is, why do you feel that of all of the candidates running today that Paul Simon is the best equipped, best knowledgeable, the best man to sit opposite Mikhail Gorbachev? I think it is a question not only of sitting with Gorbachev, but of the, of the whole spectrum. And here, the differences between the candidates are not cataclysmic, but there are differences in degree. Number one, I bring more experience in government than any of the other candidates, particularly experience in foreign affairs and in dealing with the economy. Number two, I really have a commitment to make the kind of investments we have to make. I don't shy away from using the tools of government. We're, we're not going to move on the, the question of urban education, for example unless there really is strong federal government leadership. I, I was in Louisiana the other day. Dropout rate in Louisiana, 46.8%. Dropout rate in Japan, 2%. Now, are we just going to drift into the future and not make investments that change that? I think we have to do that. And so I'm willing to use the tools of government. Third, I think if you look at the long history, I've been willing to stand up and do the tough things. And then fourth, I believe I have demonstrated a strong commitment to both defending this country and to seizing and creating opportunities to move on the arms race. Senator, we've reached that blessed point in the program where I stop asking the questions in the well, audience. I'm greatly relieved. <laughs> I know that there are three people in the audience who are going to ask uh, questions. I don't know what they're going to ask. I don't know who else is going to uh, stand up and ask questions, but you do have that opportunity. There are three microphones, four microphones down here, two in the balcony. Please, when you ask your questions, just a question, no speech. And uh, Senator, please, on your part, if you could keep the answer short so we get more of the questions. Uh, let us start the questioning now from the floor with Francis Bator, the uh, Ford Foundation Professor of International Political Economy at the Kennedy School. Professor Bator. It, it's a great pleasure, Senator Simon, uh, to welcome and old-fashioned liberal, I hope that's not the kiss of death in 1988, uh, in any event, a, a liberal with, with no prefix. But in one particular, you pose for someone like myself a puzzle. Uh, having spent about 40 years 
studying budget rules for the government for an economy like ours. Uh, I've come to agree with, with most, not all, most of my economist colleagues uh, that a balanced budget rule for the federal government, uh, even with a lot of loopholes, is a very bad rule that counter-cyclical shifts in the budget position of the federal government play an absolutely critical role in uh, moderating fluctuations, uh, uh, swings in, in, in output and employment and in, in the real economy. Take 1981, 1982, good deficits. They saved us from a very bad recession, also 74, 75. Now, there's no argument that the deficits of 84, 87 have been very bad deficits, but uh, one doesn't want to prescribe uh, penicillin just because once sort of a patient swallowed the whole bloody bottle in one sitting, as, as it were. Now, my puzzle, Senator, how is it possible that a sensible, level-headed fellow like Paul Simon uh, advocates a, 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 a rule that is as foolish, uh, <laughs> even dangerous, as a balanced budget amendment for the, in, in the federal constitution. Okay. Mr. Senator, that's an easy one. I'm just yeah. <laughs> First, uh, it's interesting that Thomas Jefferson, 1796, wrote a letter in which he said, if, if I could just add one amendment to the constitution, it would be to require a balanced budget. But he wanted a rigid one. I do not favor a rigid one. What I have favored is one that says you have to have a 60% vote for precisely the kinds of situations that you're, you've talked about. But we cannot continue to have interest just mushroom. Fastest growing item in the budget is interest. We had done the politically easy thing. When I, when I was first elected to the state legislature in Illinois, I had, a man wrote to me from South Rock, Santa, Illinois, had 13 points to his letter. First 12 were increased services he wanted from government. The 13th point was cut taxes. We have adopted his program. And, and, and you, you just can't keep that up. And so you have people who are, uh, I think, generally of progressive persuasion. Someone like George McGovern, who's not a radical right winger, as I recall, uh, favor having this kind of a requirement. The other thing that is happening that is almost unnoticed is not only are we squeezing out our ability through increased interest payments to respond to education, health care, and other things, there is a massive redistribution of wealth that takes place. Who pays the $203 billion this year? By and large, people of limited income. Who gets the $203 billion? By and large, people who are more fortunate economically. And so we 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 compound the problems of something that's happening quietly in our society. It doesn't make the headlines, but eventually it will erupt in real problems, and that is there is a shrinking middle class. Few people moving up, more people moving down, and that interest payment compounds that. Question in the balcony, please. Uh, Senator Simon, I think it's widely recognized that some of the social investments made in the 60s and 70s were often poorly managed, sometimes poorly conceived, and yielded poor returns. How do you intend um, to ensure that your programs will yield the, the intended returns? Well, there are programs that were not massively successful, though I think that most historians now looking back at that period have come to the conclusion that they were very wise investments. And I have seen a lot of programs that really have worked. I helped to create something called 94-142, which mandated that all handicapped young people in our country will have a chance at the public schools. I remember the opposition that we got on that. Uh, that has turned to be out to be a tremendous help to hundreds of thousands of people. And we either pay attention to our problems, for example, 23 million functionally illiterate adult Americans. Do we face up to that problem and do something about it? Or do we continue just to just drift 
and say, oh, no, no, we can't do anything about it. I may be labeled a big spender if I want to do something about it. Let's tackle our problems. Let's, let's shape our own destiny. We can do it. Question right here, please. Senator Simon, uh, have any of your Senate colleagues endorsed your candidacy, and if so, who are they? The, uh, my colleague in Illinois, uh, Senator Dixon, has. A number of colleagues, if you wish to check, are out quietly being of assistance, have not publicly endorsed me. I think there will be some endorsements before too long. Um, but uh, I haven't, frankly, pushed on that side of things for a lot of endorsements that way. A number of House members have endorsed me. Uh, but uh, I'm really trying to get out there in Iowa and reach the people rather than spending a lot of time uh, jawboning with my colleagues on, on endorsements. But I think you will find some endorsements coming along before very long. Senator, again from the balcony, please. Okay. Senator Simon, according to a New York Times op-ed piece, you are a co-sponsor of a Senate bill that supports the closing of the Palestinian Information Office in D.C. It is run by an American citizen and reportedly has violated no laws. Um, could you explain your position and in particular address the First Amendment considerations? Yes. First of all, I am a civil libertarian. I used to be on the board of the, of the uh, Civil Liberties Union in Illinois, and I think you will find that the ACLU uh, in general uh, supports positions I take. The reality is the PLO claims credit for murdering a number of Americans. Now, do we just let them go ahead and operate an office in this country? Now, if American citizens want to open an office, to advocate the positions that the PLO favor, I'm going to be the first person to defend that. But for, for an entity that claims credit for killing a great many Americans just to open an office, uh, I, that troubles me. And that's the reason for the resolution. Gentleman right here, please. Senator, uh, in your over 30 years in public office, uh, and I lived in Illinois when you were a state office holder there, I hope uh, that wasn't the reason for your leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to have taken an unusual interest in developing the nation's human resources, uh, particularly through support of educational initiatives. Uh, the nation's educational product is getting a pretty bad rap these days. Uh, what would your educational priorities be uh, for the next administration? It's a series of things. We already talked about adult education where, frankly, the payoff is going to be very rapid in just in dollar terms. There are some things where the payoff is not going to be that rapid. We know from tests in Ypsilanti, Michigan and New York University, for example, that intensified preschool education programs in disadvantaged areas have a dramatic impact on the dropout rate, teenage pregnancy rate, and the crime rate. We know it. We're doing almost nothing about it. I think we're going to have to invest money there. And there the, the, the return is going to be long term. Second, in the area of curriculum, we're going to have to do much, much better in this country in a, in a host of areas. Uh, and I want to have a few carrots out there. Not huge expenditures, Marvin, but, uh, but some carrots to let people know this is a federal priority. For example, we're the only nation on the face of the earth where you can go through grade school, high school, college, get a Ph.D., never have a year of a foreign language. We wonder why we have a trade deficit. One of the reasons is very simple one. I used to be in business. You can buy in any language you want to sell. You have to speak the language of your customers. And incidentally, one of the results of that also is we have the only foreign service in the world you can get into the foreign service without the knowledge of a foreign language. It's an incredible thing that we tolerate. I'm, rem I'm reminded of, uh, I've got to give you one fast quote that I think is well worth the extra 30 seconds here. <laughs> I'm reminded of, of H.L. Mencken, the old Baltimore Sun journalist who used to enjoy giving us the needle and talking about our linguistic and cultural provincialism. H.L. Mencken one time wrote, if English is good enough for Jesus Christ, it's good enough for me. <laughs> okay, right here, please. Thank you. Senator Simon. The Central American nations are the third largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid behind Israel and Egypt. And El Salvador, in particular, receives roughly $500 million a year, half of their annual budget from our tax dollars. Yet most experts say that a large sum of that money is going to line the pockets of the military and the right-wing death squads. As president, 
what policies would you implement, what economic policies would you implement towards El Salvador to prevent further human rights abuses and to put an end to the war there that has resulted in over 60,000 Salvadorans dying? Our whole policy toward Central America has been about as short-sighted as it, it could be. Uh, El Salvador is one of the more complicated situations. I've, I have no problems in cutting off aid to the Contras, for example. That clearly should have been done a long time ago. Uh, the Duarte regime is an improvement over what they had before. Uh, it is at the same time, as you suggest by implication in your question, not a strong government. I would like to see them do a better job. Precisely how we handle things in El Salvador, I don't know. What I do know is that we have to stand up for human rights, whether it's El Salvador, whether it's South Africa, whether it's South Korea, or where it is. And then I think there's a second fundamental where we have not, where we've made a great mistake. Uh, and I'll illustrate with a story. Our family drove down the Pan American Highway to San Jose, Costa Rica in 1969, five years before I was elected to Congress. In San Jose, we visited with Jose Figueres, the former president of Costa Rica, whom I'd known slightly. In his living room was one autographed picture. This is right after Richard Nixon had defeated Hubert Humphrey. It was an autographed picture of Hubert Humphrey. And I said, I'm curious, Mr. President, why do you have that autographed picture of Hubert Humphrey there? I'll never forget his response. He said, we sense that Hubert Humphrey really cares about us. We have to have a policy that is built upon caring for people, not a Pollyannish way, but upon caring for people and not viewing them as pawns in an East-West struggle. And I think if we do that, we're going to have a much more effective foreign policy. So would you continue so, direct economic support funds to the government of El Salvador? I think we would at this point. Uh, I would also want to stand up firmly for human rights. I think simply to abandon the government of Duarte would be a real mistake. I'd like now to call on Jill Neptune, the vice chair of the Student Advisory Committee of the Institute of Politics, where the senator, by the way, was a fellow at one point. Welcome back. Thank you. And I think I am the only former fellow, the only alumnus of the Institute who has ever been a candidate for president. That certainly qualifies me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of attention is right now focused on Washington and the upcoming summit. And I was wondering, if you were president today, what your agenda would be for the summit when you're meeting with Gorbachev on the arms race and beyond, um, what other issues you'd like to see addressed. And kind of in a related question is whether you think these summits are useful. Um, you've kind of promoted yourself as the non-media candidate, the non-blow-dried, the non-packaged. And whether, whether these summits are really real opportunities for breaking ground or if they are strictly photo opportunities. No, I think they are important. And I recognize they can be used for photo opportunities. Richard Nixon, with whom I don't always agree, said uh, uh, the President of the United States and the leader of the Soviet Union ought to get together at least once a year. I couldn't uh, agree more. As far as the agenda, I would hope it would be beyond arms control. I think one of the things that the President of the United States ought to be very clear about is on human rights. Whether it's El Salvador, somebody just asked about, or South Africa, or the Soviet Union. I, I have worked in, on the problems of divided spouses and some of the refuseniks and just incredible problems these people face. Uh, and I don't do it from the viewpoint that we're absolutely perfect on everything. We have problems in this country, no question about it. But uh, I think we ought to push the Soviets there. And then finally, as president, if uh, Mr. Gorbachev is there on January 21st, 1989, uh, I'm going to say to him, if you're still willing to stop all nuclear warhead testing, we'll stop all nuclear warhead testing. It's verifiable. That really moves us a substantial step away from the arms race. Uh, thank you. Next question right here, please. Senator, do you support a comprehensive family policy for our country? And if so, what specifics would that policy include? And what leadership would you bring to the issue that would get it on the agenda? Well, I encourage, when you say a comprehensive family policy, I don't know exactly what you would include. But clearly, I have said we have to move on the jobs front. 
uh, and the, the, the public sector jobs programs that I, I advocate would be of, of particular help to women and female-headed households who are disproportionately among the poor, and those, those homes are really our disadvantage. Second, my stress on education clearly would be of great help to the families of this nation. So I, I think there are a series of things that we can do that really would help families in this nation. And one of those, incidentally, being here on a campus, I, th I think we ought to gradually shift away from that, those, uh, the, our loan reliance to more grants so that people, once they get out of college, if two people in college are not overwhelmed with loans, they can, they can buy a home. They can do the things that we think are part of the American dream. Next question on the balcony. Senator Simon. Through much of the 20th century, American prosperity has been fueled by the strength of our manufacturing sector of the economy. Now it seems that it's somewhat in a state of decline, in part due to high wages, in part due to poor research investments by, um, by management. How, as president, would you try to revitalize the manufacturing sector of the American economy? I agree with 90% of your, the assumptions in your question, and I think it is absolutely vital that we do so. We have accepted this myth that we are becoming an information society, a service society, and that we can have prosperity with that. just isn't going to happen. Silicon Valley in California, they've lost 30,000 jobs in the last few years because the information base follows the manufacturing base. The reason for it is not, however, high wages. Uh, the average worker in Japan today, for example, makes more money than the average worker in the United States. The reason is policies. That atrocious tax bill that passed last year, I was one of three people to vote against it. Uh, that tax bill, among other things, reduced the amount that a corporation can deduct for research. Absolutely as short-sighted as anything we could do. Anyone who believes that we can become a more productive, more competitive nation by cutting back on research, I'll sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. Uh, it just, you know, it is not, not, shouldn't be done. We have to encourage the manufacturing sector, and I think it has to be done with presidential leadership, job owning to some extent. I also think it has, requires some changes in the tax law. Question right here, please. Senator, uh, in spite of what some people say and statistics that try to represent, be represented as fact, the state of Massachusetts really is suffering from crime. Now, if you were elected president, how can uh, a president uh, lead a nation against, uh, a, in the battle against what is quote unquote the enemy within and to uh, attempt to uh, provide citizens uh, a safe um, home. Dramatic changes are not possible and you should not expect that whether Paul Simon is elected president or anyone well, else. But but, okay, let's get, let's get but, but, but I, th I think there are things that we can do. And uh, what we know, for example, is uh, that uh, those who are high school dropouts are much more likely to get involved in crime. I was at a breakfast in New York City the other day. Dropout rates in New York City among Hispanics, 61%. Among blacks, 57%. We have to give people an opportunity to lift themselves, a, a real opportunity for, for a better education, and that's going to ultimately help on crime. Uh, the, the jobs bill, you give people an opportunity to work, give them an option other than crime, and I think it will help. And then there are other very practical things. The drug program, we need, we need something more than public relations slogans. Uh, we need uh, interdiction, we also need, for example, uh, seminars for teachers to, so they can tell when someone may have a drug problem. Those are the kind of practical things we have to do. Senator, a final question is Mary Jo Bain, a professor of public policy here at the Kennedy School and director of the Center for Health and Human Resources Policy. Uh, Senator Simon, when you answered Marvin Kelb's first question about the costs of, of your domestic proposals, you implied that with regard to the guaranteed jobs program, we needed to make those investments partly because they would help deal with the problems of what people have called the underclass with teen pregnancy and so on. The, the model for the jobs program, though, seems to be the 
WPA model from the 1930s, uh, when, which was designed for relatively well-trained, experienced people building bridges and, and so on. Can you help me understand how, how a jobs program now could deal with the, the serious problems in the cities of people who have not been part of the, of the labor market? Uh, not very well trained and, and so on. How, how, do, how do the states make that work? How, does it, how do they do it in conjunction with their welfare programs? Or How, how do you see that happening? Okay. Uh, first, I'm going to send you a copy of my latest book. Let's call let's put. I read it. Okay. <laughs> well, if you know, last Sunday's New York Times, very interesting that William Wilson, who's written the book, The Disadvantaged Society, that is getting a lot of attention right now, he said, the only piece of legislation that really deals effectively with this whole problem, the disadvantaged society, is the bill by Senator Simon. Uh, we move in into any community and we say to people, if, you're out of, if you've been out of work five weeks, then we will give you a job 32 hours a week at the minimum wage, project selected by local people, and then there's a screening process. If you can't read and write, we're going to get you into a program. If uh, you can't speak the English language. We'll get you into a class. If you have no marketable skill, we, we'll try and help you. So that we invest in our people and lift them. We, we finally face a choice, ultimately, of paying people for doing nothing or paying people for doing something. I'm conservative. I want to pay people for doing something. Senator, in about 15 seconds left, why did you wear a red bow tie? Because I heard you were going to wear a red tie. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all for being with us today. Next week, another candidate, Pat Robertson, a Republican candidate for President of the United States. And now on behalf of the Joan Shorenstein Barone Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy and the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, I'm Marvin Kalb, and we'll see you next week with Candidates 88.